The origins of many creatures in the lands between are steeped in mystery. So many of our videos here at Square Table Gaming struggle to uncover the truth behind the monsters we face in the lands between. And while we are able to dig up enough information to make solid assumptions, it's not often that the lore of a creature is made clear. But every now and again, we're given enough information to say definitively where a monster comes from. On several different occasions, we've covered topics related to magma worms. Our videos on the Tree Sentinels, the Dragonkin Soldiers, Yura and Eleonora, and the Drake Knights all briefly discussed the dangers of Dragon Communion and its connection to these land-bound monsters. Even so, we've received requests from our audience to give these almost dragons their own dedicated space, where we can lay out their origin and look a little more closely at the process behind becoming a dragon, even if that was never your intention. Welcome to Elden Lore, our weekly lore series diving into the stories of the people, places, and monsters of the lands between. If this is your first time visiting the channel, welcome. We're glad you've decided to spend some time with us today. If you end up enjoying our content, please consider subscribing to the channel and becoming a member of our incredible community. With over 100 lore dives under our belt, we hope you can find whatever information you're looking for. But if not, let us know in the comments. We also have a Discord where we all come together to talk about our favorite FromSoft lore and theories, and share pictures of our pets. Whether you subscribe or not, thank you for joining us for this lore dive. And with that said, let's get back to the topic at hand. In order to understand what the magma worms are and where they come from, we first need to understand Dragon Communion. This ritual is how those outside of the Dragon Cult came to gain the power of dragons. In order to perform Dragon Communion, one must slay a dragon, take its heart, and consume it at one of the communion altars found in the lands between. There are only two of these altars, and both can be difficult to reach. The Church of Dragon Communion is on an island only accessible by passing through the Coastal Cove, and the Cathedral of Dragon Communion, located in Caled, is defended by the decaying dragon Exiges, who was known as the Dragon Communion Revenger, and took particular issue with those who hunted his kin. Indeed, at the Cathedral, we can do battle with a couple of banished knights, who have clearly slain a dragon or two and partaken in communion. Both of these altars are draped with the remains of an ancient dragon, and you can see the red formless power of the dragons, dancing like a flame within the stoop where we perform the ritual. We first learn of Dragon Communion when speaking with the Bloody Finger Hunter, Yura. We won't dive too deeply into his story, as we already have a previous video going into the details, but Yura seems to have hunted dragons before. You bloody half-wit, picking a fight with a dragon. Well. I can tell you want to see it through. Seems I'm forever crossing paths with hotheads like you. If you summon him to help with your hunt, he tells us about Dragon Communion and its dangers. That was my first dragon hunt in quite some time. Paired up with a hothead like you. It was just like old times. Now that you've so impressively felled that dragon, there's something you should know. The heart you brought back. It's used in Dragon Communion. If you should find yourself overcome by hunger for the heart, yearning for its strength, then seek the decrepit church on the little island off the western coast. You must not forget, though, those who partake in Dragon Communion will one day shed their humanity, their hunger for dragon, their yearning. Only worsens until the floodgates burst, unleashing eternal torment. The strength of a mighty dragon. Magnificent, but deadly. It's no surprise that dragon communion is ruinous. We are certain that Yura himself was not truly a hunter of dragons, even though he admits to having participated in a hunt previously. We think it's likely that he assisted a friend of his who was, the Drake Knight, Eleonora. 
This is bolstered by the fact that Yura does not utilize Dragon Communion incantations, while Eleonora does. Through Eleonora, Yura learned what Dragon Communion would do to those who indulge in it too often. Over time, the hunger would overtake them, and they would change. This would begin with their eyes, which took on a deep yellow color, while their irises became slits, mirroring those of the dragons they hunted. How Eleonora conveyed this to Yura, as the Drake Knights are said to have never spoken a word, we cannot know. Perhaps she broke this rule while journeying with her dear friend. Or maybe they saw this change take place with their own eyes. Either way, it's thanks to Eleonora that Yura was able to provide us with this little history lesson. So if you indulge too often in Dragon Communion, you become a dragon. Is that such a bad thing? After all, those consuming the hearts of dragons for their power are clearly trying to obtain the strength of dragons. However, Dragon Communion does not turn you into a majestic creature capable of flight and able to summon lightning. It instead turns one into a land-bound magma worm. The incantation Magma Breath provides us with the details. One of the incantations of Dragon Communion transforms Caster into a worm to spew magma breath. Those who have performed the Dragon Communion will find their humanity slowly slipping away. Once they fully succumb to their fate, they are left no more than worms that crawl the earth. This is further asserted by the Magma Worm Scale Sword. Curved greatsword wielded by magma worms, the shape resembles a dragon's jaw and is covered in hard scales. It's said these land-bound dragons were once human heroes who partook in Dragon Communion, a grave transgression for which they were cursed to crawl the earth upon their bellies, shadows of their former selves. This is mostly true aside from the part about these creatures only coming from humans, as we see a clear example of a non-human becoming a magma worm in Theodorix. When we obtain Theodorix's magma through the act of Dragon Communion, we learn this is a superior incantation of Dragon Communion, channels the power of the Great Worm, Theodorix, transforms Castor into a Great Worm to spew a large volume of magma breath. The name of the ancient troll warrior Theodorix lives on, as a hero of the war against the giants. As we know, the trolls took the Golden Order's side in the war against the giants, and the fact that Theodorix was not only present during this war, but was performing Dragon Communion, means that this practice is ancient enough to have existed before Marika took full control of the Lands Between. The story of Theodorix is fascinating, as it opens up many possibilities into who the Magma Worms across the Lands Between could have been before they were turned by their lust for the power of dragons. It would have been easy to assume that all of the magma worms were once drake knights who took their quest for strength too far, but we now know this is not necessarily the case. For instance, Magma Worm Makar is a named battle we encounter at the top of the runestern precipice, and while there is no lore specifically calling out who he was before his transformation, we can assume he was someone loyal to the Golden Order, as he blocks the only entrance to the Altus Plateau aside from the Grand Lift of Dectus. There's also the Magma Worm we face in Gale Tunnel, who mysteriously drops the Moon Veil, a magical katana known as a masterpiece of a Selian swordsmith. While it would not have made sense for a former Drake Knight to be carrying this sword, it could make more sense that a Selian sorcerer was exploring the merits of Dragon Communion, and eventually became a worm. This could be seen as antithetical to the idea that sorcerers did not study magics based in faith, but the Dragon Communion seal tells us, indeed, Dragon Communion is too primal in nature for the term incantation to be appropriate. So perhaps they saw it as some other form of power, worthy of study. As for the magma worms at Fort Laid and the Volcano Manor, perhaps they were once loyal to Praetor Rikard, and they gathered the strength of dragons in order to feed themselves to the serpent and make their lord even more powerful. In the end, those that sought the power of dragons through force and murder rituals 
were twisted and deformed for their hubris. Unlike those that walked alongside the dragons in the ancient dragon cult, those who consumed the gravelly hearts of these beasts would never come to wield their lightning, a feat even achieved by the incomplete experiments of the Nox known as the Dragonkin soldiers. Those that prayed at the altar of Dragon Communion would develop roars, claws, and breath of decay, ice, and fire, but would ultimately be left with nothing but magma pouring from their deformed jaws and wings too weak to even raise them to the sky. They would not become the dragons whose strength they coveted. Their ultimate fate was to roam the land on their bellies as punishment for their sins. So think twice before devouring the hearts of those dragons you fell, because while the eyes of a dragon may look intimidating on your tarnished, you may just be dooming them for all eternity. Thank you for joining us for this week's lore dive into the magma worms. As I mentioned earlier, we've always discussed this topic as it relates to other characters, but we wanted to give them their own space so you didn't need to watch multiple videos for their full lore. Do you believe the Drake Knights ultimately became magma worms? Or did their practices prevent them from overindulging in communion? When do you believe the practice of Dragon Communion started? Why is Caled the only land where we can find a Dragon Communion altar that isn't hidden away? Who do you think Makar was before his transformation? Please leave your thoughts and theories in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell, and set notifications to all so you never miss out on any of our lore dives. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore.